All right, welcome to Experience League Live. Today we'll be jumping into the Marketo Measure Discover dashboards. Pumped to be here today. Um, this is brought to you by Experience Experience League, our Experience League, the web on the web, uh, where it's kind of your go-to for all things Adobe products. Uh, as you want to go deeper into your product knowledge and learn more about the awesome things in which you can do. Um, let's jump in to some intros. We got James today. And then we got Andy as well. Love it. All right. James, uh, tell me about what is this? Winnebago's? What are you doing? Like, how are you revamping <laughs> these cars? Uh, yeah, I mean, it, you, you work in Marketo long enough or Marketo measure long enough fixing things. And then you just want to do something with your hands. It's basically the same right. thing. Um, yeah. But my favorite thing is like buy a camper on Facebook Marketplace, and but in another city. Like I bought one in Cincinnati and I drove, I just bought a one-way ticket and drove it back to Denver. And All right. That's just, quite the you risk. Just hope, you hope yeah. it gets back. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So what do you do at Adobe? What's your role here? Uh, I'm a technical <clears throat> advisor for Marketo Engage and Marketo Measure customers. Uh, so kind of sit between support and ACS, the consulting services and, help our, our CSMs um, kind of problem solve with, with customers. So whether it's best practices, uh, you know, the scoring field isn't working the way we want it to, yeah. uh, things like that. Uh, basically just walking through like, you know, what's a partition? How do we, how do we solve for this? Um, so everything, but like actually getting in and doing the work. Um, but my background was marketing ops at Marketo and Adobe. Um, so one trick pony, but the one trick is like for sure. products for sure. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Awesome. All right. And then we got Andy. What's going on, Andy? What's happening? Uh, the second so one trick pony. the second one. <laughs> yeah. That's right. We don't, we don't do much here other than one thing. <laughs> um, so if you're looking for a market, a measure, this is a good place. All right, Andy, uh, tell me about Coachella. What were you, uh, break that down for me. Yeah, so I don't know if you guys saw my controversy recently when I didn't know how to beat mesh. No, I'm kidding. That's that wasn't me. Um, I uh, yeah, play a I play hand percussion, so bongos and conga drums with different DJs. And one of the DJs, shout out Justin J, just happened to get invited to play Coachella in 2019. So brought me along. First time experiencing Coachella, pretty amazing. Apex Twin was there that year. Um, Lizzo. Uh, yeah, pretty pretty awesome way to see Coachella for the first time with the uh, the artist wristband, and my yeah, life has been slowly declining ever since. Do, <laughs> yeah, all of us have. Uh, do they <laughs> do they loop your bon your uh, bongo? No, it's all organic. Okay, it's completely one hundred percent. Yes, hand handcrafted. Awesome. So you, you just can batch. go like freestyle, and they have yep. no control over it. As everyone who knows me uh, already knows, uh, I pretty much can't do anything other than freestyle. I'm not good at preparing. No, that's we'll right. probably see that over the next hour today. That's right. So, yeah, I own that. We, own we didn't tell that. Andy about this until about a minute ago. So we just knew he was yeah. best in that way. Um, We're going to play bongos, right? That's right. <laughs> okay, that's perfect. Right. Yeah. Um, and Andy, what, what's your role within Adobe? So... Um, my role is now within Adobe, but it used to be within Visible, the startup here in Seattle, lovely sunny Seattle, where I currently am, and uh, wore pretty much all the hats aside from being a dev. So customer success, uh, sales, management, um, and kind of as sappy as it sounds, genuinely love the product, the category, love talking to people about it. And fortunately, there is a job where I get paid to do that. So. Um, Mostly uh, at this point, though, I'm a, I'm a solutions consultant, though, so um, yes. customer facing guy. Yeah, I feel like uh, selfishly for those who are listening, uh, all of us just really enjoy talking about Marketo Measure. So even if no one showed up today, this would just be a great time for us. <laughs> um, it's just the reality. We really <laughs> <laughs> I thought we were That's just chatting. Good. Yeah, we just yeah, this is just a cool way to hang out. Um, cool. Um, 
Well, yeah, let's dive on in. So, Andy, break down uh, what what's happened over the last year with Marketa Measure and, and uh, around the dashboard piece. Yeah, lots of stuff. So, um, and, and I'm imagining most people are familiar with some of the dashboards, at least. So I will try not to be too um, redundant there. But basically, um, the, the premise of Measure is that we always want to be able to have people see data in whatever format works best for them. So if that's inside the CRM, if that's inside a BI tool. But we also realize that not everybody has a BI tool, um, and there are a lot of really powerful advantages to that. So we've always had this component, this, this complement, or dedicated environment, depending on what your reporting culture is, um, called Discover, which is basically pre-built dashboards within a ABI environment. Um, and what's cool about that is that we take a lot of feedback from our customers seriously about what they use and what they don't use. And we're always trying to iterate, iterate on that, be it adding boards, um, optimizing the boards that we have. And this is, I think, our, our clearest uh, indication of what we've been up to in terms of listening to that feedback and taking advantage of the kind of latest and greatest that we've seen from visualizations and dashboards. Um, I don't know if I'm allowed to say what the dashboards are based upon. Um, they're <laughs> corporate homies of us, so whatever, shout out um, Power BI. There but, you go. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's some, yeah. So, so I think it's, it's, more relevant data that our customers want, but also visualized in a really cool, unique way that I think brings the dashboards like to the next level, like into 2024 and beyond. Um, not to say that the previous dashboards we had felt stale and old, but um, yeah, I think people are going to be really happy um, with, with what they're seeing. And they're seeing it now because they're live on the site. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> I love it. I was just going to add in the, uh, the, the data visualization piece. Uh, there are dashboards that I've heard from, uh, you know, like whenever whenever there's a new dashboard or something comes out with Marketo Measure, I feel like I get like 10 text messages from friends that admin a Marketo Measure instance are like, I love this, or I didn't love this. Um, which is great, very honest feedback. And and some of the some of that feedback was that like I now no longer have to build this in Snowflake or in Tableau or in Domo uh, or Looker or Power BI because it's in Discover and it's exactly what I was going to build anyway. So um, lots of good feedback from that. And uh, I think it's, you know, there's obviously benefits to having like a, a data visualization team and data science team. Um, but this is, this is a great way to view it. Yeah. It helps separate the gap between uh, a data individual and marketing, right? Rather than having, like you said, like having to relay this over to the team that builds everything inside of whatever visualization tool the marketing team has that readily available to them, which is awesome. And, and remind me again, what like the, the original dashboards were like the OG dashboards, right? I don't think those were ever updated until now. Almost. Am I, Almost okay. There was a early, early, early version, but yeah, we've been, yeah. We've been rocking the the previous iteration for quite a while, um, updating them. So it's not just like we, you know, developed yeah. five years ago and <laughs> sat on it. Um, but yeah, I think it was due time for um, for an overhaul. Yeah, it's absolutely. it's so tough to. I mean, in just being in the like in the the seat of having to report to executives or or like stakeholders in general, like it's you have to balance that dichotomy of like this is new and it gives you a fresh perspective and consistency because mm -hmm. everybody wants consistency obviously you can't change the, the you know what qualifies as an mql every other week uh but you also can't be showing the exact same numbers every single week you have to like throw something in there to, to get people's attention as well yeah that's well said. Um, speaking of uh, the the dashboard piece and how to kind of like the optimization of it, uh, I want us to kind of dive into more of the setting piece first, James. Right. So there's yeah. though the dashboards are super powerful. There's a piece to that that uh, all of us really emphasize when we work with clients or when we're talking with clients, which is more on the data management side, which you can do within Measure. So I'll have you share your screen and we'll kind of touch on the setting piece before jumping, jumping into those brand new dashboards, which I think will help kind of the longevity of the uses of these dashboards. Yeah, for sure. Um, so within, 
we want to switch to the screen share. Uh, yeah. I have up here segments right now. Uh, I think like segments are obviously very powerful. We'll only spend a couple minutes on on this in the touch point settings. Uh, segments are just how you can dice up your data even further on a lot of these dashboards. So if you see, you can create a segment for leads. You can create a segment for opportunities as well. Um, if you are mostly contact based, let's say you're using Salesforce, your CRM, you can have this as contacts as well. But for this, let's say, you know, and this is, this is demo data. So maybe there's a country of origin or uh, headquarters country or something like that on the lead or opportunity object or associated account. Um, you'd probably want to pull that in as we have for an example right here, uh, the country we're just looking at, uh, you know, are they in the United States? Um, are they in Canada or do they fall into a default um, uh, record? Now, same thing on the opportunity uh, that we have here, but another um, another segment we have here is, you know, do, like what product are we selling? Are we selling Marketo Engage? Are we selling Marketo Measure? Uh, this is really easy for me to talk to because this is like all I reported on, very meta very internal dog food eater of our own product. Um, but, you know, if you have an opportunity product field that pulls us in even better, uh, you know, you don't really want to go based on name, but uh, with demo data, that's kind of how you, how you, you, know, you cut it up. So this is something where you'll be able to see, you know, what's my ROI when I'm selling just this product. Um, and then the second piece of this is touch point settings. So the Marketo measure instance is such a powerful tool and it wants to look at every single, uh you know cobweb filled corner of your data uh schema essentially and this is how you can kind of pair that back a little bit so uh let's start like bottom up we're just look let's look at only attribution touch points that occurred um uh on a specific date or more or, or like recently right so anything before the first of the year in 2022 we're not really going to be reporting on you know, if you're asking me how we did Q1 in 2017, I'm going to tell you like, hey, we're just we don't report on that right now. Because like, why would what answers is that going to give us uh, to to help our um, our like forward thinking? Um, so I, I think like paring that down, it really helps the instance move a lot quicker. Second thing, opportunity name again doesn't contain renewal. This is just an example of, you know, maybe if you're not putting money towards renewal opportunities, upsell, cross-sell opportunities, then there's really not a use to, to be reporting on that based on where your marketing engagements are going. So in a, in a crawl, walk, run scenario with like marketing attribution maturity, um, I, would, I would look at renewal as that last piece there. Um, obviously it's important, but in terms of like how your marketing is affecting it. And then, um, the last one is the created date for the opportunity minus the touch point date for 180 days. So that's just an example. Uh, usually I like taking the average, um, you know, opportunity create date to opportunity close one on average. How long does that take? Okay. We're going to take that same amount of time and look backwards and say only touch points that occurred within that time period can get associated to that opportunity. Great example of this is like someone January 15th, 2022 comes through a trade show and then uh, an opportunity is open today. So that touch point from the trade show would be the, the like sourcing um, engagement for that opportunity that got open today, even though it was more than two years ago. So things to think about, uh, just making sure that data is like kept fresh and that you actually have like meaningful engagements that are, that are going towards it. So that's, uh, that's segments and touch point settings that'll really help your instance run fast and just have Marketo measure looking at the data that, that you want it to. Yeah. I think a quick call out there is with attribution and we can go to the, to the, uh, the next tab, but with attribution, um, it's about ROI, right? It's, 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 it's about what are you investing and how are you getting that back? Uh, it, and that's a big piece within attribution, right? And so when you have those date constraints, it, it's really helpful to know, okay, the money that I, in which I'm spending now, right? As opposed to what James mentioned, the money that I'm spending in 2017. So um, it, it's, it, it's, it enables you to be a little more relevant from a marketing perspective to know where if, if 
you know, your email comes to you and says, where I have X dollars to spend, where do I need to spend that? You can see that and understand the marketing initiatives that are relevant to today or, or within this year or however long, I, I feel confident in investing dollars here, right? Um, so this is our first dashboard here with the revenue overview. James, I'll let you uh, jump into that. Sure. Yeah. Uh, I mean, this is, uh, this is one of the, the boards that I was talking about that, you know, some people that create recreated this in other, um, other visualization tools and offline data, um, now don't have to because it's here, but, um, this, as we're, as we're looking at it here, uh, we're looking at the total amount of opportunities that you're seeing in your system and how many have touch points associated with them. So essentially your total coverage of, um, I guess in, a, in another way to say this would be like how effective and how broad is your engagement plan uh, and like how actionable is it? Uh, so how, how many opportunities are you touching in a perfect world? you're touching all of them, right? If they're they're further down the funnel, you're sending them content for definitive guides. You're sending them content for like what to do when you onboard with this company. Um, so ideally you would, you would cover all of them, but this is also a really good like heat check almost um, to say like, is, uh, is there something broken in the system? I mean, things break, like you inherit tech debt, especially if you, if you uh, didn't set it up to begin with, this is a really good way to see like, okay, things are getting attributed. Things are getting spread out through the system. This is exactly what we want to see. Yep. That's awesome. Uh, we're going to, uh, we had Dave Winkler. He asked a question here, Andy, I'll tee you up for this one. Uh, but the question is when you make modifications to these rules, uh, talking about the settings, is the data reprocessed? Yeah. Um, I love this question to the point of it, it could also seem like it's something we planted. Um, so I think it's important to realize that never is a, a CRM or really most of your mark tech or sales tech stack static. Um, you're always going to be making improvements, modifications and changes as the business changes, as you, you know, pick up new practices, whatever. So I think it's important for any tool to be able to adapt to those changes. And uh, the short answer to this is yes, it absolutely does. But I think that's a, a key thing to evaluate um, when you're looking at a tool because you want to be able to um, make those adjustments. Um, and fortunately, it's a very painless process. And just really quickly getting back to um, James, what you were showing with those different uh, rules that you can set up. We want those to be settings. We don't want those to be defined. We want this to match your present state of business, how you are doing things, what you perceive as the correct rules today. But because of the fact that those will change, um, the tool will be able to change and grow with you without a huge headache that requires you to, you know, rip and replace, re-implement, none of that stuff. Like this is not made in a vacuum, it's made for real world usage. So my uh, characteristic long response to uh, what could have been a short answer, yes. Yeah. But Andy's one trick is not brevity. No, that's... <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> His job is to not have brevity. I get paid um, for words, so yeah. Yeah, that's right. No, that's um, yeah, it, 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 great question. It really does seem like we planted that question, but I promise we didn't. Um, but yeah, the uh, uh, you can always reprocess these, so you can always look back further to 2017. But like, I'm I'm a bit of a marketing ops contrarian. If I had to like, if I had to put a label on it, because uh, like, if, if someone's coming to me saying, "Hey, what did we do?" in 2020 q2 like i don't know why does it matter like we we the money we spent then isn't affecting anything that we're doing now um but uh yes that that can always be reprocessed and you can always open up those settings i don't know why does it matter it's always a very warmly received response when being asked questions. <laughs> everyone should try that with their, with their executives yeah that goes. Yeah. yeah let me know how it goes um i'll, I'll back you up Get me an on call. <laughs> awesome. Hey, James, we got um, a, and, uh, a qu question from my rec. Uh, forgive me if I didn't pronounce that well, but um, in the, the dashboard, since we're going to cover a bunch of these different ones here, I didn't know, if, is there a dashboard or ask the question, since removal of the old dashboards, I cannot see a way to analyze keyword attribution. How can I do this with the new dashboards? Yeah. That is uh, that is known. That's a known 
gap currently. We do have uh, one more, possibly two more dashboards coming out very shortly um, that will three more. Three okay. more. Ooh. A Andy, do you have more info on that? Yeah, do tell, Andy. So, yeah, I basically, I'm, I, I'm glad, James, you give out your personal mobile number um, to your customers <laughs> so they can let you know what they do and don't like about dashboards. I'm kind of the same way. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there are a couple of things, actually, I'll just put it out there that um, have not yet been migrated from the previous dashboards. And that's just like a work in progress thing. Um, you still have access to the data, um, you know, depending on what tool, uh, Marek, you're, you're using. Like, I don't know if you're using Salesforce dashboards, you have your own BI tool, whatever, depending on your setup. Um, that data is still being collected and calculated. Um, it's just not yet been put into this new format. So um, that's coming. Um, I believe uh, there's more stuff that we're going to do around content reporting as well. I have a whole list of, you know, kind of V2 stuff. This is the first version, basically. Like, this is the stuff we just got out. So um, this is what we're hitting the ground running with. But yeah, everything else. And then some is going to be um, released, you know, as we often do it, just as, as people want more and we learn more. Yeah, it's awesome. Perfect. Um, I think there's a new way to uh, to save and and filter in these dashboards. Uh, one of you want to talk about that? I don't know. Apparently not. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I guess not. Uh, I remember when I, I used that. to save the, the query string uh, for for a yep. dashboard Marketo measure. Uh, <laughs> now, the new way. No, no longer necessary. We have a save filter. So if I pull this back to the lateral, actually, we that's probably a good way to just pop into our next dashboard here, the attributed revenue dashboard. But if I um, if I just want to look at, you know, how is, how is paid search doing, uh, I can kind of scroll down to paid search, apply that. Um, let's hope the demo data is like happy with me. Cool. And then if I, if I just want to look at paid search in the last 12 calendar months, I can hit save. Um, and I can, I can save it as essentially a dashboard that other people can view as well. So, um, yeah, there's some cool that like no longer saving the query strings and bookmarking them in Google Chrome, uh, which I'm pretty hyped about. Okay, so because uh, previously we had the we had the floppy disk that everyone loves and knows, uh, but it, you're right, it wouldn't share across the individuals, and you had to share the the URL to for those Correct. dashboards. So now when you save, it saves across every user. Yes. I would also like to call out, if I may, how responsive that was. I don't know if anyone was paying attention to this. That's quick. Somebody who spends a lot of time in the tool, how much <laughs> faster that data was processed. Um, yeah, let's well, I like pay a, for, you know, uh, raise the roof for I, that. I don't pay for a quicker Marketo measure. I pay for you to have slower Marketo measure. So that's <laughs> like a, just, it's like a 401k contribution. Just because take a picture. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, attributed revenue over time. Uh, I think that like this is, it, it's more of like a, a necessity dashboard. Uh, there's some that are like really cool that, that show you a lot of cool stuff. And there's some that are like very straight to the point. This is one of those straight to the point ones. Um, but yeah, being able to see that contribution um, by channel over time, you know, how much did we contribute in December 2023? This would be a good thing to come to the to the deal table with and say hey this is why we did so well in december um versus this is what we didn't do well in august so obviously showing what you're doing well <clears throat> just as important as showing what you're not doing well and that you know that and that you can you can learn from that as well mm -hmm. nice and then with the drill down features maybe we can do on the next dashboard um mm -hmm. But uh, that's also an enhancement there from our past ones, um, being able to drill into uh, the amount of data in which you can see as opposed to uh, previously. I can open that up a little more. So if you go into like, um, let's go to the top dashboards and we were to look at like opportunity data. Where at? Uh, Maybe we can look in. You can just uh, do that one. There here. it is. Show us table. Yeah. There's yeah. some options here. Yeah, but then uh, the row the row count is about five thousand. I think it is. 
as opposed to uh, in the previous dashboards, there's about 500 rows. So the export of the data is much larger, um, which is also helpful if you wanted to um, look at the raw data and do a little more troubleshooting uh, or inquire more about it. You're able to do that and go a lot deeper into those data points uh, where previously it was only about 500 rows of data. So uh, that also was a big improvement for me as I use the tool, um, as I you know, was trying to compare data to my CRM being able to export that amount, that much data was enabled me to actually compare more apples to apples with what the CRM had. Yeah, that's a, um, I, that's a, that's a really good way to then dig into those opportunities that are, that are making up that data as well. Um, mm -hmm. if you want to search them in your CRM, this is interesting. So this is our, this is our next board. Um, I don't know if we're ready to go on to the next board, but yeah, I'll just, Quick, quick, quick comment there, actually, yeah. with the drill down. So, I mean, I think for, in order for these dashboards to be useful for people, they need to be able to validate the data. Um, the fact that you can actually, and I get asked this question all the time on, on customer calls of like, cool, this looks amazing, but, you know, what if someone actually, you know, holds it to the flame and says, well, what opportunities are we talking about here? Like, how can I trust and believe this? Bam, a couple of clicks, you can actually see the actual app opportunities that are being incorporated in these metrics. Um, and you can make sure that they foot to what you see inside, you know, your CRM, or your data lake or what have you. So at each step of this process, we want to make sure that, you know, when, not if people ask questions about what is the source of data that we're looking at, you can very easily pull into that. So not just a little minor detail there, that could be the make or break of whether or not people actually buy into trusting this data. People like to dig, especially when, when you're like showing them something that looks good. They like, they like to dig in and be like, hey, what's, what, what actually is this? <laughs> Uh, I totally I get it. Um, I, I love that. Like we'll, we'll get into realize simple ROI. Um, that's, that's kind of like a newer, uh, thing for Marketo measure. Uh, I really like this cost per total new opportunity. This is something I've had to do offline at so many different organizations. Uh, it's just like, you give us X amount of dollars. We, I can give you this many opportunities. Um, qualified opportunities, like just dollars throughout the pipeline. Uh, so just being able to say like, you know, this is how much incremental we spend, spend we had on these channels. And this is how much we're like generating per opportunity. Now, then your next step is like, how quality are those opportunities? How do we, how do we in increase the quality of those opportunities? Um, but I think that's great. Uh, that and like cost per new lead, things like that are just, uh, they're, they're things that, people who spend money want to see. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the ROI is just huge. Um, and that that is often a um, request and we were constantly trying to build that um, outside of the system. So I think that's a huge win, just being able to see that. Um, now, Andy, you, you touched on some of the newer dashboards that may be coming out. One that we often use was the engagement path. Uh, which we are able to kind of see a list of data, um, whether it was account or just the ads. And then you could see like the medium and the source. Um, is that something that's going to come back as well? Or is that a different, or is there a different way to extract that kind of data? Or do you not know? That, that I'm not sure. Andy, do you know? Did we lose you? Sorry, I'm. Is anyone having audio issues? I may have some bandwidth issues. I'm. I swear, I'm yeah, not trying to skirt the question by saying that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm in a tunnel. I'm losing you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, sorry, could, could you say the question again? Yeah, I it was the. Yeah. yeah, I can reply to it. So there was the engagement path that was used very often for troubleshooting, but it also had it was just a simple list view. Uh, so, Dave, your question is, you know, where was that report or was he referring to? That was built within the um, old dashboards. It was a list view of um, persons. And then from there, you could look at the camp. You could look at the medium and the source, as well as the placement of the touch point. Uh, that is something that is coming. Um, it's just not within the, the real, these first dashboards, but it will be uh, within the next a release or two here because um, we know that was a very useful dashboard. 
Yep. And in the meantime, I would say I think they prioritized a lot of these dashboards on like what are the, the things that people want to see immediately? What are the some of the things that we can still help customers out with? So, um, you know, I'd say speak with your, your customer success manager if you're working through data validation uh, stuff. It may not be pre-built here, but there are definitely still ways we can get to that. Yeah. Yep. Um, sweet. I think to quickly go over realize and simple ROI, um, this is another way and please keep me honest here because it is, it is newer. We've talked to it a few times, um, but it's another way to look at snapshot versus cohort reporting as well. Um, you know, how many, how many MQLs did we get this month versus how many leads did we generate this month that became MQLs? So are you looking at this cohort, cohort, <laughs> cohort, uh, cohort of individuals uh, and opportunities and you like spent money on them and they close in the same month? Or like how much money did you spend in January and how much money did you earn in January, uh, even though they aren't related? So that would be that would be your more like simple ROI versus your realized ROI is over time. So you spend money in January, those opportunities don't close till February, March, April. Um, uh, just showing that I know how the months go. Um, and uh, <laughs> so down the line, you'll see that come back. Um, so I think like, Obviously, we can see simple versus realized ROI over time here. One other thing that is like so valuable that I've had to pull in the past as well uh, is how much pipeline do we have sitting and waiting to, to be closed? Um, obviously, there's a lot of factors that go into uh, whether, you know, is it going to close? Is it uh, like what's our percentage? What's our, um, you know, our ACV uh, probability, things like that. But here we can see like, where social media is touching pipeline, we have 1.47 million tied to it that is waiting to close. So it's in the pipeline stage. It's not. It's not quite revenue yet. So that's all. That's always like really good information to say. Like this 0 0.07 that we spent. You know, like that's a terrible ROI number. But we're waiting on all this and that all all this pipeline to come down the funnel. Yeah. yeah, I know some of the terminology for me, it took some time to figure out. So uh, that's helpful. And I also just quickly mention um, uh, Lakeva. Again, apologies for butchering the name, not the pronunciation. Um, so this is an, inter an interesting question. Um, there are absolutely ways to filter data when it comes to- Andy, like can you ask the question? Oh, yes. Um, so the question is, for a larger company which uses the same Marketo measure tool, how can we easily see our data and hide other division data? So this sounds like a data sensitivity issue. Um, that is something that I actually, if you are able to, um, I think we're going to have our contact information at the end of this. I'd love to hear more about the, uh, the intention behind that because um, sometimes there absolutely could be data that should be restricted. I know obviously, you know, sales, they don't want people kind of cross pollinating and playing in other people's sandboxes and stuff like that. There are filters you can set. Um, and, and hearing this question uh, in previous conversations, I think there may be benefits to other divisions having this. Data, and I haven't seen a, a real big conflict of having that happen. So, um, I do want to hear more about this. If, you know, I'll just throw my email out. It's ammo at adobe.com. Um, shoot me a line and let's talk because uh, maybe there is something we should be paying attention to. Hey, here's a perfect case if we, we want to take customer feedback for our things that we're missing on. I don't currently know of a way to do that. I don't know if anybody else on this call does, um, but let's talk more about that use case. Yeah, one one thing that sits out again, there, there's some discovery there, so I'd definitely pick up uh, Andy on that offer. But one way, if, if there's different divisions uh, from an attribution perspective, so not so much from a touch point perspective, understanding how your different touch points are going, but from an attribution perspective, uh, your opportunities are identified differently within each different business unit. And so where James talked about within the settings, um, setting up different filters in there to where you're able to say, okay, this business unit has these types of opportunities. This business unit has this type of opportunity um, or the naming convention of the opportunity is unique. So that is one way. And then from a touch point perspective, what some companies have done 
is within their UTM structure. There is specific branding within the medium source or campaign that identifies the different units. And so then you could say, okay, here's these different ads that we ran. Um, and so you can filter based upon uh, your UTMs to be able to say, this is how our branding performed over this branding. What you also see there is a cross pollination that happens as well, because as you are marketing to uh, want your, you know, one specific type of business unit, you see uh, that another business unit might be engaging with those types of ads. And so you begin to see a little bit of that as well. So it doesn't necessarily remove and, and completely um, segregate those touch points from each other. But what it does is it helps you understand, hey, we're spending X number of dollars. 80% of those dollars or 80% of that investment is going towards the people that we're targeting. Another 20% is going towards a different business unit, but maybe that's good or maybe that's bad, right? We don't know. So um, those are different ways in which I've seen customers approach that as well. I think you read yeah. the question correctly. It's probably less about like privacy, but more like filtration and segmentation, like you said. I showed you my best effort right. as a diplomatic response of, actually, you probably should see the rest of your division's day data. Um, so. Yeah, thank you, Ian. <laughs> I, I, I was just gonna add one note there that like, you'll never get it perfectly correct. Uh, when Adobe acquired Marketo and uh, and then acquired Magento, that's now Adobe Commerce at a very similar time. Um, I, I merged those Marketo instances and we're selling like both products that are real, that we had like a maybe one or 2% customer overlap uh, I mean, such different use cases between those two products um, that we're spending money here. We're seeing these touch points get associated to accounts that are buying this other product, even though we're spending money on this product. But campaign naming conventions really help. Um, but yeah, it'll never be perfect. Uh, like you're always going to see product A and product B. Um, but yeah, I, th I think the segments are a really good way to, to look at that. Um, I think we can, can we breeze through the passport uh, boards real quick? And we just like, yeah. those are pretty simple boards. There's not a ton to look at there. So like uh, the lead passport is how many leads that I have hit a specific stage in this amount of time. And you can add custom stages as well uh, within the settings. Um, but if I, you know, now give me all the leads that are in this you know, they're in ABC country or DF country um, or United States or Canada. So there's different segmentation you can use here. Um, if I'm just looking in the past 12 months, maybe, or the last like seven days, like you can kind of do all that reporting. Uh, same thing with opportunity here. So uh, this is actually in the last seven days. Uh, you know, this is how many opportunities were created. This is how many went and hit the demo stage. So it could be that they're created and then hit demo stage next kind of immediately or within those seven days or they were created previous to the seven days and they hit demo stage within the last seven days. Um, and then uh, also here, like how many opportunities we have created that the name contains Marketo engage or the name contains product one or product two. Um, so those are, those are the passport boards Pr really straightforward. Um, I don't know if you, y'all have anything else to add on those. Yeah, they're pretty sure pretty, pretty easy. Cool. Like um, this, uh, the web traffic, this is one of my favorite boards. Uh, I specifically made some adjustments to the, to the demo data to show this. Um, hopefully it's still in here, but th this is one of my, this is uh, very similar to the content board um, that, that we saw way in the past. I don't know which iteration of it, but when I used to, uh, uh, when I used to manage it, uh, our internal instance was like, okay, give me everybody who has downloaded an ebook um, or has downloaded a definitive guide. This is a really good way for a content team to see these are the channels that are pushing to the content that I created. So if we do URL contains blog, and then we use our fast instance, we're not going to use Andy's. Um, uh, so we can see the visuals are loading here. Uh, but yeah, we should be able to see, this is how many people came through, visited blog pages, um, things like that. Cool. So we had unique visitors, 304,000 and on average, you, you know, four blogs, uh, these are all the, uh, the different unique emails we have, 
that were created from forms, different form fills, things like that. Um, but yeah, we're able to see these are the channels that push to it. Uh, and then here's like the referrers that they're coming from. So, and we sent it through outreach or we sent it through Git pocket, whatever that is. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I, I do, I do love this dashboard. That's cool. Uh, with the filtering, James, do you need to be case sensitive or does it pick up if you do capital B blog versus lowercase blog? Does, how does that work? That's a great question. I don't think it's case sensitive. Yeah, I don't think it is either. Uh, but I wanted to check on that. Um, and one other uh, thing. Oh, cool. So you can uh, you can basically expand this um, and see like this is how many you know, our five examples of B2B case studies uh, was kind of our highest performing blog. Uh, if we change this to, you know, in the last one month, we can see more recent data instead of 12 months. Uh, so yeah, being able to expand that is great. Now that also relies on if you're setting up your website via Drupal or, um, or WordPress um, or Marketo, engage landing pages, you need to have those URLs consistent so that it contains blog in it or contains ebook or contains definitive guide um, or webinar or something like that. Um, anything else to add on uh, on this one before we go to engagement? No, that was good. Cool. Uh, engagement, I think the only thing uh, I, I wanted to kind of hone in on here was uh, we we were doing this is in uh, 2018 doing a lot of upsell and cross sell trying to sell Marketo measure uh, formerly known as visible uh, and all of those campaigns in, in like a, in an agile marketing sense where you have your theme your campaign and your tactic campaign being like another word for program essentially uh, everything was prove impact. That was our, that was what we were kind of selling on. That was our theme. So whether it was a webinar or an event or PPC or whatever it was, we were, uh, we started all of our campaigns with PI dash. So we were able to look and say, okay, campaign name starts with uh, PI dash. And I believe I made the necessary adjustments. Um, so when, when we launched this campaign, nope, looks like it's, was there a, sorry, a bit of a, bit of a mess up there. Um, I tried though. You could see, you could see how it would work. Um, so uh, on here, you're able to see like, this is how many uh, people that we engage with, with this campaign. This is how many touch points we had on average per person. This is how we're doing month over month. So mm -hmm. this is something that we had to create manually. We'd, I wish it was around back then. Um, but uh, yeah, specific like campaign theme reporting is really good with this engagement dashboard. Yeah, I can't tell you how many times I've worked with clients where that that's the ask, right? And we have to do that inside the CRM and, and build that out or we have to work with the, the data team to build that out and, and a data visualization tool. Um, and from a attribution perspective, you know, this is what really helps marketers do better marketing, right? It's not necessarily what you're reporting up to or using from an executive standpoint, um, but it is something as marketers, uh, as I worked with different teams, just to better understand how is this overall initiative or campaign going? And as, as James mentioned, that that's a kind of a good little, uh, Hint there as far as naming convention, right? Just having something where it's okay, we're running this campaign across multiple different initiatives or you know sources, and then being able to have that kind of branding in place to be able to see what's the overall impact, how well is the engagement. So I think it's a great call out. For sure. Um, last two dashboards we have. Um, any any comments before we move on? It's one of my favorites. Good. The velocity ones. Oh. Crowd favorites. Let, it, let us have it. I mean, I think this is a cool example, and I'll let you, you know, uh, do the do the full walkthrough, but the context for this is that we realized that given the depth of data that 
visible once upon a time is able to collect because of the fact that we have comprehensive tracking across all ad channels and have really you know accurate up to date in, you know instantaneous information around the progression of deals and leads and opportunities and all that there is also the capability of producing velocity reports um, and while I wouldn't necessarily call this like standard attribution metrics, um, it's nonetheless super helpful for marketers and people get really excited about it because who doesn't want to shorten their sales cycle length? Um, uh, James, I'll let you go kind of through how to actually use it. But I mean, yeah, velocity reports. Come on, people. No, I mean, I, where's, I, the, where's I, the air I, horn? Let's let's hit that air horn. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think uh, th these are some of my favorites because it's like you the the concept of nurturing people in uh like higher up in the funnel is a great concept is it actually used effectively or is it uh, like does it actually help where if we if we engage with someone through uh like display ads or retargeting or something do we actually have a higher velocity or have them become an mql quicker um a lot of those questions that like they're in theory they make, make sense to ask, but this is how you can actually answer those questions. Um, uh, I think more importantly with, uh, with op velocity, like the, oops, I already had it load here. Um, part of my contrarian, my marketing ops contrarian personality is that every time sales ops or sales leaders ask me for something, I ask them for something back. Um, that being in, in this scenario, Hey, why does it take, uh, 133 days on average for a, a opportunity to go from demo to follow up? Like, are, are you scheduling the demos out too far or like, is it cleanliness and data fidelity? What is it that's, uh, that's like causing it to, to last in, in that stage for that long? Uh, so I think it's always like being able to come to the table with data and say, hey, we can totally increase um, or like we can work on increasing the quality of these leads specifically. Um, tell me why these leads only get converted to an opportunity like at an 8% rate, you know, like being able to have that like co you're like co-parenting the instances essentially. And it's not just that you're like a service desk or order taker. Um the opportunity velocity is huge on that. Um, so I think, I think laying those out uh, to, to rev ops is, is incredibly important. And I think yeah, that's a really good example. Oh, sorry, really quickly. I mean, we're talking about sales and marketing now. Like we're talking about the intersection of these two different potentially contentious teams that have their set of data and then marketing has theirs and never shall the two actually kind of check with one another. Um, now we're talking about actually collaborating. And I mean, frankly, these are reports that sales does use. I mean, sales could have their own version of, you know, their instance of this, that they're able to, to log in and start to answer questions as well. And this was, kind of, you know, mm -hmm. the, the glory days of marketing are when those two different teams are able to collaborate and, you know, eating our own dog food. We get, definitely get to benefit from that internally um, during those kinds of, uh, of, of those meetings. Yeah, well said. Awesome. Um, <clears throat> there was only one question here I wanted to make sure we get back to, uh, which is what do the numbers next to the filters refer to? I don't know if there, if that's just the number count um, within how many filters you've set. Uh, I'm not sure what it's referring to. Um, yeah, on the right hand side, if you were to actually like set if you open one of those up and choose, maybe it was like a specific mm -hmm. board. Yeah, there, so it says four, oh, so geez. BDR four or display six. Great question. Yeah. I think I don't those have the are answer, the number of channels that question. are configured, maybe? I'm guessing, but that's- so, Sub channels within yeah. that channel. Uh, the number of sub channels within that channel. Mm, that makes sense. Like literally, I think that was just added. Like that's the fun thing about this is like things will show up in engineering is uh yeah always always yeah we went, we went from having dashboards for what like eight years to uh, something that's constantly evolving, which is good yeah. um, for the better. But uh, yeah, that, that's a, that's a great call out. And then Dave, you you nailed what engagement the, a different way to approach um how to define the engagement report so good on that piece 
Um, yeah, uh, Marek just asked, how do we save reports? Um, well, I think you showed that earlier, James. If you want to quickly show that again on, on the saving piece, on how to save, that'd be great. And, and to so, clarify that, mm -hmm. oh, sorry. Um, are we talking about building a report from scratch as you would in a BI tool that is your own personal instance? Or are we talking about saving filters, um, which actually says, or can you only save filters? So I'm not sure if we want to get some clarification there first. The answer to that, if, if it is the former, is basically you don't have the ability to build out a custom tile, custom visualization from scratch yet. I think that's maybe all I can say about that. Um, it is just filters as, as far as I know. My my right, the rest of the team on that one? Yeah. So okay. you have the custom report here. That's right. To be continued. So if I want to save over an existing uh, custom report, you can you can save over that. Saving is new. So I mean it's the same thing as as any other like um, uh, any any other system, but uh, you can set it as a default as well. But I set that custom filter. Um, come back to the ROI dashboard. It's uh, if I I right now forget if I change that to my default, but we have it here in J James's custom filter. Nice, awesome. Shout out, shout All out, right. Dave, for the answer to that question too. Yes, we were right. <laughs> oh, no. All right, team. So uh, now we're going to uh, what we wrap up Experience League Live with, which is the unrelated cool tip. All right. And I think James, is, James has got this one here, which really shocked all of us. I got, uh, I got my, uh, my co-presenter here. here. There you go. <laughs> Great. Very good co-presenter. You got to be right. Very there. mellow. So yeah, I uh, I I rescued Archie off of Craigslist uh, a few years ago. He's a border collie, and I learned this that some uh, specific like sub breeds of border collie are allergic to chicken uh, because their job was to uh, protect chickens uh, on on farms. And so uh, I I don't know how I don't know the specifics. I got a, a degree in communications, so don't ask me the the genealogy of it. But um, they bred them to be allergic to chicken, uh, so they wouldn't eat the chickens. There you go. I was pretty blown away by that. Cause I'm like that, it's pretty smart. But I don't know how you do that either. I'm also a communications major. I have no idea how you, you would even do that. Do you want to know how you find that out? Because <laughs> It's by feeding the chicken. <laughs> and uh, it does not work out. It's not like they're going to say no. I mean, they're they're house pets pets now. So yeah, you put it in front of them, they're going to eat it. Yeah, and they'll then, they'll eat it. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. That's my unrelated cool tip. There you go. Thanks, James. Cool. Well. Uh, thanks to everyone who joined today. Uh, you can find us all on LinkedIn. Andy put out his email there as well. Uh, but reach out to us. Again, we love talking about Marketo Measure. If no one showed up, we would still sit here and talk about Marketo Measure. That's how much we enjoy it. So um, feel free to reach out and um, let us know how we can support you on your journey. Um, but thanks for being a part of Experience League Live. Appreciate it. Thanks for joining. Good combo, yeah. fellas. Yeah, thanks, gents.